This video is sponsored by Skillshare, who I'll quickly take a moment to thank. And it's easy to thank Skillshare because it's just a really great learning platform with thousands of inspiring classes. And as a lot of you know, I've personally enjoyed plenty of them. Like, for example, a course called Outdoor Photography, See, Shoot and Share the Beauty Around You by Min T, which was just a really efficient and well-constructed crash course that sort of takes you through the process from shooting to editing, which is exactly what I needed to motivate myself to dust off my DSLR and get back on the photography train. So whether it's a specific skill you're trying to learn or you're looking for inspiration or you're looking for a new skill or you just want a refresher on something that you want new, uh, Skillshare is perfect for you. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Being a licensed tie-in with middling review scores and releasing in the Christmas run-up of 2004, everything was working against Ghost in the Shell standalone complex's chances of entering the zeitgeist of fondly remembered PlayStation 2 games. Critics described it as average, as a rental, as third-person cannon fodder, but it's actually quite a special little game that deserves revisiting. It just feels good in your hands. The movement is fast and responsive. The Max Payne-esque camera never gets in its own way. The guns are loud and punchy. It's a, it's a really good first impression, as is hearing the voice cast of the show or the drum and bass inspired soundtrack by San ODG, which I'll never know how to say properly, of Tekken and Ridge Racer fame. It's just cool, like you can tell there's a sleek aura to standalone complex being far from a thrown together cash in. Uh, Sony bankrolled and published this in Japan, which explains why it's a PS2 exclusive, before it was published in the West by Bandai, and it was developed by Caviar, the Drakengard developer that brought a certain passionate streak to each of their releases. Uh, even the options menu adds to this feeling of thoughtfulness and production value, with a widescreen option and audio options and remappable controls, things that you wouldn't often see on console back then. It also supports progressive scan, which is always a nice touch. There's no need to remap the controls as most of what you need is mapped to the triggers, freeing up your thumbs to stay aiming and moving, and you'll never need to awkwardly wrangle your way into pressing two triggers on the same side. It's a small thing having good control mapping, but it's these small things that add up to standalone complex being instantly welcoming. As we all know, wall jumping makes everything better, and this has some real spicy wall jumping. Like, you can wall jump up to three times in a row, and you have a lot of control over the direction of each wall jump, which, when coupled with a bumper you can hold to grab onto ledges, results in a very dynamic mechanic. You sort of get the sense that you can climb absolutely anything if you nail your wall jumps. A dauntingly tall stack of shipping containers? There's probably a way up. A random balcony up high on a skyscraper? It's worth a try. Uh, light bulb moments manifest when you figure out the unobvious ways to reach something, and it's cool that the game trusts you enough to figure things out for yourself. Not to mention the simple joy of just being so mobile during combat. Because you are so mobile, the levels are designed with verticality in mind, and they can be really quite striking. Uh, the game rewires your brain to look up and down more, where you'll see a plane fly over, or a cityscape vista, or a rooftop you can jump down to to surprise attack your enemies. There's a, there's a slight feeling of vertigo at times, as the game has a real knack for making you feel very high up, like precisely jumping around on tiny platforms on a container crane while taking down enemies is thrilling, especially after looking up at the crane towering above from ground level earlier. One single slip up and you'll fall, there's, there's no hand holding, but the movement is so precise that it works. At one point I sort of went off the beaten path and climbed up a bunch of shipping containers to jump over a fence, and in doing so I skipped a huge chunk of the level, and the game just rolled with it. Uh, there's a certain freedom that you're afforded while moving through these levels, thanks to your mobility and the open design. It helps that this is a great looking game that still holds up with care for colour palettes and background geometry and memorable architecture, architecture that doesn't always obviously direct you forwards, giving you that illusion that you're discovering an area by scaling around a small ledge on the side of a building or dropping down a huge drop. Like with the platforming, the level design trusts that you'll find your way, and it makes you feel smart when you do. 
Combat is snappy and you can use a trigger to do a secondary attack, whether that's a grenade or a melee attack, depending on which you've equipped by toggling a face button. And having a secondary input for this stuff feels very modern for a 2004 game. Grenades fly in a good arc and have great explosion effects that send enemies flying and melee attacks feel great thanks to them magneting to enemies seamlessly and thanks to some punchy animation and visual effects. Don't be late. <laughs> Hey, this is one man who's never late for his dates. Something standalone complex the anime did really well, which is the anime this game is based on, which itself is based on the original Ghost in the Shell manga and not necessarily the far more well-known 1995 movie. It's a, it's a whole rabbit hole, don't worry about it. It's worth going down the rabbit hole, but you know, basically, the anime this game is based on had action scenes that did a really great job at conveying weight and impact, and I think a lot of that is translated into the game with the explosive combat and the powerful gun shots. Even the small pause your character does when jumping serves as this extra kinetic heft that makes you feel like a physical presence rather than a video game character gliding around. When everything clicks together here, it really clicks together. The combat doesn't always click together though, in fact it's actually quite flawed. Uh, the frame rate struggles a lot, there's no aim assist which would be fine if this were a PC game, but it's not so it's not fun trying to sort of wrangle with the joystick dead zones to aim properly. Uh, the reload button is also used to pick up weapons which can be annoying. Uh, enemy snipers are maddening as they can take you down in one shot. The dodge mechanic could be more useful than it is. The enemy AI are particularly brain dead, like sometimes you can just stroll up in their face and start punching them before they notice your existence. And upping the difficulty doesn't make the AI smarter, it just turns them into bullet sponges. Uh, none of the difficulty settings strike the perfect balance, like medium is a bit too easy and hard's pace is killed by it taking forever to take down enemies. Uh, thankfully you can change the difficulty whenever you want from the level select screen, which like a lot about this game, also feels very modern. So despite how so many of standalone complexes parts can gel together to create such a unique and interesting vibe, when you look at the combat in isolation, it does come up slightly short, which pains me to say because everything surrounding it and supporting it suggests that it should be better. Nothing highlights the problems with the combat more than the levels where you're playing as a character named Bato, rather than the usual, more acrobatic, Major Kusanagi. Bato can't wall jump or grab onto ledges and his levels reflect that, often being a series of dark indoor corridors that you've seen in some form or another in other shooters. The music and sound design still lend a lot of much needed sleek sci-fi ambience to these levels and they do get better as you go along. Uh, I particularly like when you're handed these giant rocket launchers to send clusters of enemies into walls, but where Kusanagi's levels are radiating with this carefree openness, these Bato levels are restrictive and flat in comparison. They take up about a third of the game, but it feels like more than that. If you're familiar with Ghost in the Shell, you'll know that toying with grand philosophical or political ideas are staples of this series, and it's something that does take a bit of acclimating to. Uh, the standalone complex anime is uncompromising. In fact, unlike the game, it's not immediately inviting at all. I found it took a good half dozen episodes before I even started to click with its idiosyncrasies and techno babble. It's, it's, it's the kind of show where if you miss a single line of dialogue, the rest of the episode might not make any sense. Now imagine trying to pay attention to those unmissable techno babble lines of dialogue while you're in the middle of a fast paced shootout and therein lies the problem with the storytelling in the standalone complex game. You won't fully follow it on your first playthrough, especially when reaching an objective will cut any dialogue off. It's annoying because the cast is as good as ever and the story itself is actually quite compelling, which I only figured out by replaying the game. It's just poorly told, with the pre-rendered cutscenes and briefing screens providing little clarity. What's extra weird is the game is far too willing to pause itself for trivial reasons, like every time you use a terminal or scan a dead enemy to get other enemy positions, the game interrupts itself to tell you very basic information. 
there's a hacking mechanic where you can take control of certain enemy units, which is at times really satisfying as your enemies watch in horror as their ally betrays them, but the long pause to do all the basic timing hacking minigames is so arduous that it too often just isn't worth doing, especially if you're playing on an easier difficulty. Uh, the game should have instead paused or slowed down to tell you vital plot information, which instead is just thrown to the wind. That's not to say that this isn't a good tie-in to the anime though, beyond the voice acting and aesthetics, because on some level it's as good a video game tie-in as I've ever seen. Uh, the consistency between the anime and the game enhances the game so much, and, and, and what I mean by that is what's usually brushed off as a bunch of video game tropes like the heads-up display or the fact that the playable characters are so much more powerful than everyone else is actually canon in this universe. Like, where Nathan Drake is a one-man army because it's a cheesy video game and you should just accept it, uh, Major Kusanagi actually is a one-man army, that's how she's portrayed in the anime, and as a fan, being able to play that is both rewarding and immersive. There's a satisfying consistency and diegetic cohesion to it all. So while Standalone Complex is clearly a flawed game, like it's not hard to tell why reviews were middling and if you don't click with the style or if the anime doesn't do anything for you, you'd be forgiven for dismissing this as bland, I found it to be refreshing. Its dynamic verticality and rapid pace appealed to my game design nerd brain and it got me daydreaming about how shooters could and should take pointers from this and its wonderful aesthetics and atmosphere only endeared it to me further. As a short five hour romp, Ghost in the Shell standalone complex stands out as an inventive and inspired PlayStation 2 game underneath its imperfections. And there we wrap up the video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please, you know, like and subscribe and, you know, engage with the video so the algorithm likes it more. Um, there's a couple of things I neglected to mention in this game. Uh, there's a there's a section where you drive a Tachikoma, which is like a big sentient crab-like robot thing. Um, and it's it's it feels like a throwback to the original Ghost in the Shell PS1 game where the entire game was driving a Tachikoma, but here it's just sort of there, you know, I didn't feel it was worth mentioning. Um, it's it's just a brief okay section that's over before you know it. Um, and there's also a multiplayer mode, which is a very typical uh, early 2000s split screen up to four player multiplayer mode that's fairly fun because, you know, the movement and shooting in this game is fairly fun. So it works, um, but yeah, just not much to say there either. Uh, there's also a game called Ghost in the Shell Standalone Pom Complex for PSP, the exact same name, but it's a completely different game. Uh, it's an FPS game. I've never played it, but you know, if you want me to, leave a comment and, you know, I might. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed discovering this game for this video. Um, it's, it's sort of a, it's a bit of a process as I go through a bunch of different games that I that I think could be good and most of them aren't and then I find one that is good and I'm like yeah cool I want to review this one and, and um, yeah it's it's fun it's it's fun discovering cool PS2 games but uh, yeah as as you have been seeing patrons have been coming up on the screen so if you want to support me uh, elsewhere you can send me a buck on patreon and that'd be cool but otherwise thank you for watching take care of yourselves uh, goodbye <laughs>